So for this section, we're going to be uh, looking at uh, some limits again. Uh, some of the stuff we're going to look at here is uh, going to be kind of a repeat of what we already know about uh, using limit statements to talk about end behavior and also uh, behavior on asymptotes, which we uh, started out with because uh, we've had some experience with that already. Um, so we're going to take a look at uh, this problem here. The directions in this part are going to be the following. We're going to find the limit as x approaches infinity of our f of x. And <coughs> remember what we're asking for here is obviously a limit. Okay? But <coughs> what is this going to tell us? This is going to tell us about the functions and the behavior as we go to the right. Okay? So this is a, really what we call the right end behavior. Okay, it's going to tell us what's the function doing as we let x get infinitely large, what's going on as we move infinitely far to the right. Okay. So in this particular case, <coughs> if we were to uh, investigate this function, okay, what goes on as we let x get large, okay, we could certainly look at a graph or table, that's one thing we could do. Okay. <coughs> the more we can do without graph or table, the better though, in terms of us knowing about math and doing well on the AP test. If we have to spend a lot of time on this looking at calculators and tables, it would uh, take away from other time from difficult, more difficult problems. So let's think about what's going to happen with this function based on what we know about the graphs of these individual functions. If I have sine 2x, okay, what's going to go on as x gets bigger? Okay, what's sine going to do at infinity? It's just going to continue oscillating back and forth between 1 and negative 1 in terms of y values. True? So essentially it doesn't really grow at all, does it? What about x though? What does x do? If we let x get infinitely big, then the bottom numbers are going to get infinitely big also. True? So eventually what's going to happen if, the, if this doesn't get big but the bottom gets big, okay, then what kind of numbers are we going to get when we do this divided by this? If I have, let's even say 1, okay, divided by 10 million, okay, that's going to be a number that's very what? Small. Very small. So with that said, the answer to this is really just what? It's 0. Okay. Because the bottom function here is going to be a faster growing function than the top function, which means that the larger numbers will be on the bottom, which indicates that we're going to go eventually to zero here. Okay, our numbers are going to be negatively, cl negatively close to zero. All right, and so that also indicates then that we have a y equals zero horizontal asymptote. One of the things that we studied in uh, pre-calc, advanced algebra. So again, that implies that we have a horizontal asymptote for this function, just thinking about the graph. All right, <coughs> and uh, I can't grab the arrow. Let's try that again. There we go. Implies. Okay. And a matter of fact, they would imply each other, so we'll double arrow it. All right. Now, <coughs> with that, if we look at uh, what would happen as we go to negative infinity <coughs> with the same function, because this would be our second. Uh, Step. If we're going to negative infinity, let's think about what this function does at negative infinity. Okay. Okay, we already know this is going to the left. This isn't going to do anything different than the right. It's still going to go between 1 and negative 1. This is going to go to negative infinity, essentially. True. And so, therefore, if we took, again, just an example of like 10 million, this would be you know, either 0, 1, or negative 1, whatever, somewhere in between. And this would be negative 10 million. So my answer would be essentially be, again, 0. Just call it negative zero if you want to, but that wouldn't make much sense. So zero is not positive or negative. So ultimately, we get zero again, and we, which again would imply a horizontal asymptote. So same deal here. And keep in mind that uh, <coughs> for a given function, does the right end behavior and the left end behavior have to be the same? Not necessarily. No, it could be completely different. Okay. So even though we have a horizontal asymptote to the right, okay, do we necessarily have a horizontal asymptote to the left? Anybody think of a function where we have this same horizontal asymptote to the right, but not a horizontal asymptote to the left? <coughs> I can think of any functions that we've ever dealt with that might have that behavior. Part of your syllabus was a gallery of functions. Maybe I might want to refer to that so you have it all memorized. It's e to the power of x. What's that? E to the power of x. All right, e to the x. 
is close. Okay. Ultimately, to the right, though, e to the x would grow. To the left, it would have a horizontal. It would be the exact opposite. How could we make it so it was the opposite of e to the x, so make it go be reversed? No. Uh, can't, natural log doesn't have an asymptote here. If we have e to the x, if e to the x looks like this, which is essentially the opposite behavior that I'm asking you about, okay, how could we make it go like this instead? <coughs> if, we, th if this is e to the x, the question is how could we make it be e to the x but going the other way, if you will? Okay. Be e to the negative x. Okay. <coughs> if I did the opposite of it, <coughs> The opposite of it would change the y values and it would flip it this way. This, this would be the opposite of e to the x down here. Okay. So if we need to make something be reflected over the y-axis, okay, then we make an effect on x. Okay. Over the x-axis, we make an effect on y, which means we'd have the negative sign out here. Okay. So like I said, this would be a function with a horizontal asymptote going to the right, but it wouldn't have a horizontal asymptote to the left, would it? All right, <coughs> now, um, again, so part of end behavior, again, is just to investigate what's going on as we go infinitely far to the right and left, which also could match up with some horizontal asymptotes, possibly. Okay. Could be the same on both directions, might be different, possibly. Okay. All right, and then the other uh, thing I want to look at here with the same function is uh, when I graph this function sine of 2x over x, the uh, question is, is it a hole or is it an asymptote at zero? As we can see that zero is going to be a problem. So let's check it out. We're not sure. Okay. With the sine function, there's really <coughs> the algebra that we're going to do here. It's not as easy as uh, factoring and canceling out something to see if it's a hole or an asymptote. Um, but if we uh, take a look at a graph, and we got sine 2x. Tell me why it didn't work first before I do it. <coughs> why didn't we see a graph? What might be wrong? If I do sine 2x over x and I see nothing. <coughs> the window could be a problem, but knowing that function sine 2x, all those numbers, you know, there should be some variation of sine of 2x, which could be around the origin. Okay. But yeah, mo the modes and what? Degrees. Modes and degrees. Yeah. Okay. So troubleshooting the calculator is an important skill. So we can see that, uh, looking at that, I'm going to zoom in closer to that standard window. And uh, what does it look like here in terms of uh, asymptote or hole? That yeah, looks like a hole, doesn't it? Okay. And had we looked at that sine x over x function, remember I, we, we looked at that earlier, okay, we knew that the limit there is 1, so that means there's not an asymptote for that one either. So we might have had some you know, insight into whether it was a hole or asymptote just based on how it's related to the sine x over x function. And you notice that, uh, I, mean, I don't know if there's a pattern or not, I don't know if we can say that there is based on sine x over x, the answer was 1, you remember. Sine 2x over x, the answer for the limit should be what? Looks like it's 2, doesn't it? Okay. So could we, just, could we say now that we know that sine 3x over x is going to be 3? We might conjecture that. Okay. Um, just because we think so doesn't prove anything, but it could be very possible. We could look at some more examples and see if we can... Uh, <coughs> think that might be a possibility, but ultimately um, it turns out that the answer is yes, we won't prove it now, but um, the answer, if you do have sine nx over x, the limit at zero is n, okay, whatever that number in front of x is, that is the actual limit. Okay. All right, so based on that, then there wouldn't be any asymptote behavior here to deal with for this function, okay. so we wouldn't ask for any limit expressions regarding the asymptotes here, because there aren't any. The limit at zero is just simply zero even though there's a hole there. Okay. All right, so let's take a look at uh, <coughs> one where we do have uh, an asymptote like the function x over x minus 2. 
If we had this function, there is definitely an asymptote here because there's no algebra we can do to get rid of the x minus 2 on bottom, which, which would indicate a hole if we could. But we know that there's an asymptote here at 2. So if we were to draw this graph, we'd have an asymptote at 2. And our question then is, what's the behavior around the asymptote? So like I said, we've, we've discussed this already, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. But part of your work today, you're going to be talking about behavior in your asymptotes. So when we see this indication, what are we asking for? What's the behavior of this function as we approach 2 from the left? Right? And again, we could plot some points here and see what it is. But uh, if it's a calculator problem, which it is today, we can use that. So if we do our uh, x divided by x minus 2, and if I get y equals, that would be more helpful here. There we are. So x divided by minus 2. Uh, at this point, too, calculator-wise, I'm getting good at using calculators. Had I not put parentheses around the x minus 2, uh, what would it have graphed? So yeah, what would the picture look like if I had not put parentheses? It would have been a horizontal line at negative 1, true? Because what's x over x? 1, and 1 minus 2 is negative 1. So make sure that any time you put it in a binomial expression or a polynomial or any kind of polynomial that's more than a monomial, say even monomials, I'd put everything in parentheses just to be safe. Okay. So put the entire expression in parentheses. And okay, the standard window, we can see the uh, behavior near the asymptote is as such. So if we were to draw a quick sketch, something like this. And with that said, we could answer the question now because we can see that as we approach from the left, the answer is going down, so negative infinity. And of course, if we wanted to check to see on the right hand side of the asymptote, we'd have infinity. And again, keep in mind that the, uh, <coughs> the directions here, you know, finding limits, that's, you know, if they just ask you to find the limit, obviously that's fairly clear at this point. Uh, I want you to look on page 72 though. On page 72, if you look at that 17 through 22 group, it says uh, for part B here, it says, well, let's, let's start with part A, I guess. It says find the vertical asymptote for the graph. Okay, Keeping in mind that when we answer part A, if we were to answer that for this particular equation, the answer would not be 2, okay, because 2 is not a vertical asymptote. 2 is a number. Okay, how do we indicate that it's a vertical asymptote? We write the equation for the vertical asymptote, which is what? x equals 2 would be your answer for part A here, if this were our problem. It's not, but. And then for part B, it says to describe the behavior of x to the left and right of the vertical asymptote. Okay, we need to make sure we understand the directions in order to get this exactly right. Okay, this is the answer to part B. Okay, this is how we describe. We don't write, well, it's getting lower when we get close to the asymptote. We don't write those words down. Okay, this is how we describe the behavior. We describe it with limits. Okay, so your answer for all those, if you're at however many we have in that group, your answer is going to look like this. It's going to have a limit as we approach the asymptote from the left and one as we approach from the right. Okay, that's how we describe the behavior near an asymptote. Okay? So they're not asking you to write a paragraph or anything. They want you to write two limit statements and that's it. Fair enough? Okay. All right. <clears throat> now, the uh, other part besides uh, what we've dealt with so far, okay, which like I said is primarily review, uh, is <coughs> we're, asked to, uh, we're asked to find uh, sometimes end behavior models. Okay. So that's what we're going to look at next. So we're going to look at uh, what we call end behavior models. Okay. And we're going to start out with uh, <coughs> the following. Uh, generally, for us, we're interested in uh, finding an end behavior model for a rational function, for instance, like this one. Okay. So if this is our function, our question <coughs> ultimately is going to be the following. We want to find a power function end behavior model for f. Okay. And so anytime we have a, a rational function like this, I remember if you uh, have forgotten a rational function is just a polynomial divided by a polynomial. So if we have that situation where we have a rational function, they may ask us for a power function that would model the behavior of this function. Okay? 
Now, we can, of course, we could graph this and we could look at it and say, oh, well, it's going up, but we want to actually find a function that behaves just like this function at infinity and negative infinity. Fair enough? Okay. And like I said, if we were to look at a graph of this, we might say, well, it kind of looks like a parabola or it kind of looks like a cubic function. I mean, it'd be difficult to tell from the graph on what the model would be. Okay. So what it boils down to, though, is that it's all about the leading coefficients. This is how we're going to answer this question if we need to find an end behavior model, a power function end behavior model. Okay. We're going to take a look at those leading coefficients because really at infinity, the rest of these uh, terms don't really have much of an effect on what the function is doing. Okay. The highest power terms are going to dictate what the function does at infinity. Okay. Because we're dealing with numbers that are so big that the rest of these terms are essentially negligible. Okay. So we're going to take a look at these terms and we're going to essentially do the math on them. We're going to take negative x to the fourth and divide it by x squared and we're going to get negative x squared. Okay. And so the answer to our question is this. That right there is a power function okay, that is an end behavior model for our given function. Okay. So let's see graphically if that makes sense to us. So let's take a look at our top function. <coughs> Positive of x to the fourth plus 2x squared plus x minus 3. And the bottom squared minus 4. And we'll standard window here. And <coughs> you'll notice that uh, at this point, with that, with the given function that we have, we can see that we have two asymptotes, negative two and positive two. As we can see the domain here, negative two and positive two should be either asymptotes or holes in this case. There's no factoring on the top that we can do. However, we don't see anything outside those asymptotes. Okay, so does that mean there's nothing out there? No, of course not. So to get some uh, insight as to what's going on out there, I would probably look at my table. Okay. If I do my table function here, I'm gonna go back to my table set and just do whole numbers. Right. And if we look at our, uh, <coughs> we know that of course 2 and negative 2 are errors. If we look at our y values near, uh, we can see the stuff that's going around around the origin. But as we go away, and, and again we don't necessarily even have to look at the graph to, to, to figure out whether this is the right model or not. Because what's going on as we move up, which is away from negative 2 to the left, these numbers are getting infinitely what? Small. They're getting infinitely small. And as we go to the right of 2, and those numbers are getting what? Smaller as well. And what do we know about the behavior of this? This is an upside down parabola. So, so far, so good, wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. right. And so if we were to graph this and we were to graph that and get the proper window, we would see that ultimately at infinity, okay, that those two are going to behave very similar to one another. Okay. And like I said, we'd have to <coughs> expand our window out a little bit here. We can That's a little better picture. And uh, <coughs> when we uh, graph that, again, now we can see those two branches. And again, at infinity, we're going out here. And it doesn't really necessarily look like negative x squared because of the way our window looks. But if we were to actually put negative x squared in here, okay. what do we see? I mean, you can see it graph there quickly on there. But out at infinity, those two functions are essentially what? They're the same, aren't they? All right. So again, what have we found here? We found a power model, a power function that is an end behavior model for that given function. Right. Now, we also can find end behavior models for other functions that are not rational functions, like say this one for instance. If we have x squared plus e to the negative x. So let's say that's our function. And we want to find an end behavior model for this. Now, <coughs> with a rational function, we can generally find just one function that'll model both sides. It'll be a right end behavior model and a left end behavior model. But for this function, if we take a look at it, let's see what it looks like. So if we go x squared, oops, minus e to the negative x. So, 
And if you look at the picture here, obviously we're going up as we go to the left, down as we go to the right. And our question is, is there a way to find one function that models both ends? Well, the answer in this case is, is no, generally. And it usually is not the case when we have something that's not a rational function. Okay? Because if we look at the, both the end behaviors, right and left, okay, just think about the right one, for instance. If we go to the right here, what does it look like that function behaves like? Does it look like any other function that we might know? Think about what this function is made from. It's made from x squared and it's made from e to the negative x, true? Right. So as we go to the right, okay, then what does it appear to look like? Well, it kind of looks like a parabola, doesn't it? Okay. Um, so we could say that maybe the x squared function could be a right end behavior model for this. The x squared function would not be a good left end behavior model though because if I go to the left, it, it doesn't look like a parabola at all. Okay. It would have to go back up, number one. Right. So in terms of a right end behavior model, maybe that x squared would be a good model. Okay. And that would be a, an, a simple function that would do the same thing as that function at infinity. Okay. Why is my understanding of the derivative of the parabola? Um, I think I have it typed in exactly like I do. x squared minus e. Do I have, oh, sorry. There we go, try that again. Okay. There we go. All right, so I guess in this case, we might say, yeah, does it, could it be x squared? I mean, it kind of looks like a parabola, right? So maybe x squared could be for both sides. And it could be, okay, but we'll have to figure out using some uh, techniques here that I'm about to show you, whether or not x squared is the right end behavior model or the left end behavior model, okay? So, like I said, we could graph the x squared and we could see that it might be, and let's do that, because that would be a good conjecture at this point, is that it might be x squared. And so if we look at it, it, the original function compared to x squared, it looks like the x squared on the right-hand side looks perfect, doesn't it? But on the left-hand side, it kind of behaves similar to what we got going on, but not exactly perfect, is it? So our thought at this point would be that's, that the x squared is probably the right-end behavior model. It probably is. We're going to show how to prove it here in just a minute. Okay, but on the left side, maybe not. Maybe not the x squared function. Okay. So here's how we show that that is, in fact, the case, that it is the right end behavior model. So we show that the limit as x approaches infinity, okay, we're going to infinity, so this is the right end behavior model. And what we're going to do is we're going to take our original function and we're going to put it in a ratio with what we think the answer is. Right? And again, we think the answer is x squared. So we're going to put those two in a ratio with each other. And here's what I want you to think about. Okay? If these two the top and bottom, if those two are the same function at infinity, then what should be the answer to this question right here? It should be one. Because okay? if those two are the same, okay, then at infinity, they, that we should just get one for our answer here, then shouldn't we? Okay? So the question is, can we show that those two are, or that the answer to this is one? So the answer is yes, of course, otherwise we would be doing something different. And what we're going to do is uh, similar to what we did a minute ago with our x uh, plus sine x over x. If we separate these two, okay, and we take the limit individually, okay, looking at these two, we know clearly that the answer here is 1. one. So that's 1. And then what about this over here? If I have e to the negative x and I have x squared, okay, what's this doing as we approach infinity? e to the negative x goes what? Goes down, goes closer to 0. This gets bigger, so ultimately we're going to get real small numbers divided by real big numbers, which gives us what? Zero. Zero. And so what's the answer to this? One. And that right there, that information, that work, okay, is our proof that x squared is the right end behavior model. For x squared plus e to the negative x. Question so far. All right. Now, we said earlier that that x squared probably is not the left end behavior model because they look like they're a little different going left. Okay. So, what might we think could be maybe a left end behavior model for this function? Any idea? Oh. Oh, you're right. Say it again. How about e to the negative x? I mean, that going to the left, it looks 
could, like it could be an exponential function. That's a decay model, right? Mm -hmm. Could be. And so that, you know, really, the only thing that we even had to go by are the two parts of the function that we have. I mean, we, if we just guessed something else, we could try it, but it's probably not likely to work. But let's see if that e to the negative x is going to be the left end behavior model. So again, we would make a limit. This time as x approaches negative infinity, because we're doing left end, x squared plus e to the negative x over e to the negative x, and then separate and evaluate. So we'd have the limit as x approaches the negative infinity of x squared over e to the negative x. And then over here, we'd have plus e to the negative x over e to the negative x. So if we separated those two, that fraction into two different parts. And let's look at this one first. We already know the answer to this one is 1. And keep in mind that we want to get an answer of 1 here. If we get an answer of 1, then we're good. We found the answer. We found the right behavior model. Okay? If we get something other than 1, then we got to try something else. Okay? So let's discuss this one then. What is going on here? Okay? These are getting infinitely big. Okay? And as we go, remember, keep in mind that uh, we're, do we're doing negative infinity this time. Okay? But a parabola to negative infinity is still going long way for you guys to play. Okay? So it's still going up. So these get infinitely big. What about e to the negative x though? e to the negative x going that way also gets what? Infinitely big. So the bigger issue is which one gets bigger faster? Okay? Is the exponential function a faster growing function or is the x squared function faster growing? Okay. The exponential is. Okay? And we're going to spend a little more time on faster and slower growing functions later, but Ultimately, at this point, hopefully we know exponential functions are always going to outgrow any polynomial. Okay? So therefore, if these get bigger faster, then this is actually going to go to what? Zero. So what's the answer to this? One. And again, what does that indicate? That e to the negative x is the what? Left end behavior model. Questions? Okay, so for uh, Monday,